Well, good morning and welcome to Zen Fits. Let's see if Zen fits today. I hope, um, I, I have to keep repeating because people draw, I don't know who, you know, this is not a fixed group that I'm talking to. So people can just wander in. It's kind of, this is kind of like a, uh, a, a box in a park. So I'm kind of like standing out here in the park and people walk by and stand and listen for a while and then either stay or they go on or they come back the next day. I don't know. So uh, I have to, I have to uh, kind of like uh, uh, reboot a little bit. And so when I say Zen, uh, I'm not talking about formal Zen Buddhism. I'm talking about what, uh, what Zen is to me and the way I understand it. And, and Zen to me is the awakening of uh, your, your creative mind. Uh, Zen is the awakening of, and I call this faith mind. I think that that's referred to in the Zen writings, a faith mind. Faith mind is the mind that, that is able to leap uh, beyond the uh, ledge of the unknown into the unknown to grasp greater understanding. Uh, the best example of this in movies is Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade, when he had to step out over the abyss where there was no bridge, but he had faith. So he stepped out, and it was only when he stepped out in faith, faith in nothing, by the way, this is not faith in a belief, we'll talk about that, but just faith in faith, he stepped out and the bridge appeared. It was already there, but he couldn't see it until he was out. He had made the leap of faith, you see. So anyway, yesterday we talked about uh, Zen and the mother. I hope you tuned into that. I found it uh, an interesting talk. And, I, and what I mean by an interesting talk, I don't mean your interest. I mean I found it interesting because to me, a talk is interesting when I discover something, when it informs me, when I discover something in the talk. So I'm, my talks inform myself, is hopefully you too. So let's take a look yesterday, just to regroup. Yesterday was a wild day, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we, we were drawing broad comparisons between the mother, because it was Mother's Day, and the father. And uh, which basically is, here's the mother, here's the father. Yin and yang, yang, yin. Put them together, you get some sound, you get ohm. So we were looking at it broadly, and uh, we were also looking at two ways of awareness that we all have. All human consciousness has these two ways of awareness. But in the West, we are dominated by only one way. And yet we use the other, but we don't realize it. And the one way that is dominant in the West is the one that makes stuff. Uh, the one that has built our civilization. The one that was born in the Enlightenment, called the Enlightenment, of uh, reason and rational thinking, logic, uh -huh. empiricism, logic. What's the truth? Clear and distinct ideas. And that is basically a centripetal force. And if you know the difference between, which I just, I have recently learned, centrifugal and centripetal. Centripetal is the force that goes down to, that is going towards a single point. Like, what's the, what's the stuff of, of, uh, of the world? Well, people thought it was an atom. Uh, that's the fixed thing. You know, you can't go beyond an atom. But then they split that, and it opened up a whole new world. So the centripetal awareness, that, that's the focused awareness. Like when you, in Google, you know, you start zooming in. You, know, you zoom in, uh, town, street, house, backyard. Oh, there's me standing there. And then maybe, then you put on a microscope and you go into me, go into you. Oh, you go into the body. Now you're like in uh, 
a CSI or something, uh, or traveling in the body, you know, the cells and the blood, you know, and you just keep going. Where do you stop? Well, you stop at the fixed point that can't be divided. And it's kind of like a dimension, a point without dimension. So, we're, so this, this awareness is going towards the one, to find the one that stabilizes everything. Centrifugal awareness is going out towards the whole. So that's like uh, if you go in, in uh, Nagil deGrasse, de, uh, deGrasse in a science program, Oh, it's an expanding universe, and we got the telescope, and we got, oh, we keep going galaxies upon galaxies. How far can we go? That's the one, the one that includes all space, you see. So there's the one that you get to by expanding, and there's the one you get to by shrinking, shrinking, shrinking down to the final little point. It's like Alice in Wonderland. Shrink, shrink, shrink. So you're drowning in your own tears, or expanding, expanding, expanding till you don't fit anything. These are ways of awareness. One way is through rational thought, an, 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 an analysis, logic, and the other way is through intuition. You can't analyze the whole. You expand by making leaps of understanding, and in, you expand by making leaps of understanding greater holes. When you have understanding, you have just leaped from one reality to a greater reality. Oh, now all of these, and this is what mysteries are and the British mysteries that I love, because the inspector is always making, is always withholding judgment until all the clues are in and still he can't figure out, and then maybe somebody knocks over some coffee or something Something insignificant happens, a little accident, his wife says something. Oh, and he goes, aha, and he goes running out of the house and draws everybody together. I've got it, Eureka, I've got it. You see, how did he get to, I got it. He didn't get through it by analysis. He got through it by having the failure of analysis, the failure of the search. I don't know, I can't figure it out. And you suspend, you relax the search, and you're doing something else, and Bam, it comes into your leaps into your mind. That's faith mind. It leaps into your mind and you know. Where before you didn't know, you thought, maybe, maybe not, either or, could be, may, may, don't know. But then faith mind, I know. And know is not belief, I know. And you, you're now uh, Archimedes having discovered uh, water, uh, the, his, his, the weight of Archimedes discovered the way to measure the weight, the volume of a gold uh, crown without melting the crown by putting it in the water of his tub and measuring the water. So anyway, so I hope you see the difference between these two. So let's dig deeper into this. And let's look at what this uh, fixed point is, you see. So if we're using analysis and we're using logic, and we're cutting away everything to get to that fixed point. Why do we want to get to a fixed point? What's the point? <laughs> What's the point of a fixed point, you see? Think about that. Suppose you're in a forest, and suddenly your compass doesn't work. Or you're in the desert. Or you come out of a movie, and I remember this, the first time I went to a movie, uh, on my own, I was a kid, parents let me catch a bus and go to a movie, or I don't know whether I walked to the movie or caught a bus or something, but anyway, I went to the movie, and I got so engrossed in the movie, so into the movie, uh, that when I came out, I had no idea where I was. I had lost all my reference points. There was no fixed point. And we discover this all the time. You're driving somewhere, and you dope off, you're daydreaming. And you whoop, come back, and where in the hell am I? And you look, you have, <laughs> it's not Alzheimer's, it's just the fact that, that there's no reference point. And as soon as you see a, a sign, or as soon as you see, oh, I know where I am. Uh, I'm just, I, I went past it. Or it's just a few miles up. Or I got to turn around, you see. 
So in other words, we experience this all the time. You go, you go, <laughs> you go through the door in the house, and you walk into the kitchen and say, "I have no idea why I'm in here. <laughs> I had a fixed point. Now I don't know what it is." And you go, "Well, you know." So nothing. See what I mean? A fixed point orientates us, and it's in the very simple things, or in huge things. The Middle Ages was based on the fixed point that the Earth was the center of the cosmos. The Earth was, was, was the fixed point in the whole cosmos. All the stars and planets all moved around the Earth. And on Earth, man was the fixed point. All the species, all nature revolved around man, you see. The Enlightenment destroyed that, at least the first half of it. It, through, through telescopes, Galileo, Copernicus, no, the earth is not the fixed point. The earth goes around the sun, and the sun is part of a galaxy, and the galaxies are part of other galaxies. There's no fixed point in space. What? That pulled the fixed point out of the whole cosmology of the Middle Ages, and no wonder the church burned Galileo or put him in jail. No wonder the church, because it was uh, pulling the earth from the center, destroyed the fixed point around which man orientated himself in the world. I don't know what I'm doing here. Take away the fixed point. In evolution now, and that's why it's still being resisted, there were two kingpins in a stable universe. One was that the earth was the center, and the other one was that man is the center. Well, evolution pulls man out from under the center and says, you're just like other species. What? You mean man isn't the most important species that isn't God's emissary on earth, you see? God and man and then everything else comes down, you see? What? You mean man isn't uh, significant and special? The chosen species? What? Then everything is in flux. Everything is in change. Where am I? I'm losing my orientation. So you can see right there why a fixed point is very valuable in our cosmologies. So let's look at the fixed point going down right into our, into our, uh, our everyday life. Uh, I just watched a movie called The Hacksaw Ridge, and that was about a uh, soldier who was caught in a double bind of two imperatives. One of them was he didn't want to touch a gun because he almost killed his father with a gun or something like that. He had some trauma with a gun. So he vowed never to touch a gun. And there was a war, World War II, and he had to, and he vowed, he, it was, it was uh, an imperative to do your duty to join the war. So how could you be, how could you not touch a gun and how could you become a soldier? So he took a vow. So he became a, he got in the army, but as a medic. And he wouldn't touch a gun. Well, he was ridiculed, yada, yada. But he had a vow, you see. <clears throat> so this vow was his fixed point. He would not break that vow, no matter what. Even when the Japs were coming, well, 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 he didn't pick up a gun. At one point, he was trying to rescue one of his buddies. And the Japs were coming, and he grabbed a rifle. And, the, and, the, <laughs> and, the, and the, his buddy says, oh, good, you're going to shoot him. And no, he used it as a, cr as a splint. <laughs> it wasn't a gun then. It was a splint. Okay. He didn't break his vow. But the point is, a vow become, can become a fixed point. If you are trying to quit smoking or drinking or any addiction, or even when you get married, you take a vow. The vow is a fixed point that you will, that no matter what, no matter what the temptation is, the vow will hold. Uh, Aha. <laughs> Very hard. Same with cigarettes. If you're going to, uh, if you vow, New Year's Eve, what is, what is New Year's Eve but a vow that gets broken? We, we, we can't hold our vows today. Uh, you see, vows are washed away by conditions. You see, they don't sit. Now, Buddha took a vow, uh, Sakyamuni, uh, or Siddhartha, Gautama, uh, when he felt this, he had this heartfelt desire to find 
the truth of life and and suffering. Why do we suffer? He took a, he tried all the different uh, ways, all the different uh, strategies, all the different yogas, all the different gurus. None of them held. None of them worked. So he took a vow. I'm going to sit under this tree until I awaken. If I die sitting here, so be it. So that was a vow. So the vow is a fixed point. The Bible is a fixed point today. Um, if you take a, if the Bible, if the and, and for the Bible to be your fixed point, it has to be absolute. Fixed point means absolute, not relative. Fixed point means it can't be moved by changing conditions. It's fixed. Fixed, you see. Absolute means fixed. You can't change it. So when the Bible becomes a fixed point, you can see what happens is that it, you ha it's a literal interpretation of the Bible. And that creates all kinds of problems because so much of the Bible is metaphor or analogy. So then, then it's up to the interpretation of it that's fixed, you see. And then you get into the, well, my church interprets it this way and not yours and yada, yada. We know how that goes. The Constitution become, can be a fixed point. The Republicans base their cosmology on the fixed point of the Constitution. But moving back down into our everyday life on Facebook, an opinion is a fixed point. My opinion will not be moved, and I'll fight to the death, you see. And, and opinion is kind of like uh, a mini belief. You know, it's kind of like belief light. You know, so our belief and our opinion becomes a fixed point that, that no matter what rational arguments you come up with, I'm not moving. I, because I, my whole reality just like the Middle Ages, you see, was, was fixed on the earth being the center, our, our mind gets fixed on my opinion being the center. So it's my opinion, my belief, around which is, is the hub of my wheel that makes my mind go, you see, the axle. You know, see what I mean? See how this is? Because what it is, the, we're all in the mind. Everything is mind, in the sense. Where can you go that your mind is not? Everything is mind. Everything is experience. There's nothing out there that's fixed. This is, this is the revelation of Buddha. Everything is impermanent. Nothing is fixed. And everything, everything out there is changing. Everything out there is being born and decaying. Everything is dying. Everything is born, being born. It's like a fountain out there. Reality is like a bubbling fountain. There's nothing fixed. Where can you go that you can find something that doesn't die, that is not changing, that is not decaying? As soon as you create something, it starts decaying. Everything is changing. Everything's a verb. Nothing fixed. So what do you do in a world like that? You've got to have something to orientate yourself. See, this is the problem. If you don't have a fixed point, it's chaos. You don't, you, and we all know that feeling of not being orientated, not being fixed. As soon as you find one point, everything, everything locks. Everything, oh, I'm okay now. Whew. Well, I thought I was, I thought everything was, I thought it was an earthquake. That's why earthquakes are so terrifying is because nothing is fixed. You see. So this, this idea of the fixed point, and then we can get, my guy is the fixed point. Or my, my wife or my husband is what fixes me. Or uh, my, uh, my best friend fixes me. Or uh, my president, my political leader, uh, my minister, my, my philosopher, my theologian, some guy, <laughs> you see, fixes me. This is the big problem we're having right now with Trump, is that, he's, is that the president is the fixed point in our society. It's kind of like the Washington Monument is the president as a person. The Washington Monument is a fixed stone that represents the center of our society. And the president is kind of like a, uh, a fixed person who, when he embodies, when he goes into that office, is a, the presidency as the office is a fixed point. 
The president, men come and go. The fixed point stays the same. So the problem we're having today is that Trump is not fixed. So there's there's no way to know where uh, he's here today and there today. So this he we can, nobody can fix it. <laughs> nobody can pin him down. He's changing, and that's what's creating fear, uh, chaos, and death. You see, uh, or 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 the loss of orientation. You see, when the when the center can't hold. When the fixed point can't hold, we get very, very anxious because we're, we're losing our orientation. I don't know where I am now. Maybe it's Alzheimer's. That's why we fear Alzheimer's. There's no fixed point in Alzheimer's. All well, memory goes, there's no fixed point on who I am. There's no fixed point, you see. That's terrifying, believe me. We have to really understand how terrifying it is to lose your fixed point. That's why, you know, people come home to Blackstone. They come here because Blackstone is fixed. The main street has been there for over 100 years. Oh, I'm home, I know. See, I know that. And when people meet here, like yesterday's Mother's Day, and the uh, kids come home, and what do they spend most of their time doing but upgrading the fixed point? Well, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, they, they, got, they, they, uh, they moved over, and now they're in North Carolina. And uh, what happened to this? Oh, this person did that and this. So everybody's rebooting their fixed point. <laughs> you see, we all do this. It's great. We all, our hometown, the place where we grew up, just like the birds come back to, the swallows come back to Capistrano. I remember that in California. The swallows always return to Capistrano. Uh, the birds always come back to where the salmon come back to where they were bred, you see, born. So that's the fixed point, our origin. Uh, so there's a lot involved in the fixed point. Um, and the idea here is that it's absolute. Absolute means fixed. You can't fi change it. Relative means it can be changed. It's relative. The fixed point in relativism is, is relevant to conditions. If conditions change, your point changes. This is the big battle between e evolution and creationism. Creationism is basically the need for a fixed, absolute point so that the world is static and won't change. The world is static and I'm, I'm always orientated in my view, absolute view of the world. It's created and it, that's it. God created this thing and that's it. He created men and women as men and women and that's it. Can't change them. He created uh, white and black uh, as different, uh, one above the other, and that's it. Can't change it. You see how this absolute fixed point comes in? And so relative means that if you change conditions, you can change the fixed point. And this really, you know, in a very general way, is the, is the difference between liberals and conservatives. And, and by this is not fault-finding. Basically, this is both are valid views, but you need both views. You need both kinds of awareness, not just one over the other. And that's been the big problem in our country, is that in the West, is that the, the, the search for the fixed point, the uh, centripetal awareness, analysis, exclusion, getting down to the one that is pure, the pure American, uh, the pure Christian, the original American, the original human, the original, you see what I mean? Let me hold up my thumb. <laughs> this, you know, the one, getting down to the one, you see, is excluding all the others, and that's a process of analysis. Well, they got a pimple on them, so they can't come in. Or they didn't, uh, they eat meat, so they can't come to the yoga class. You know, there's only the pure that get in, you see. That's looking for the fixed point. And, uh, but this is a valid tool, valid awareness for survival. You can't survive without that awareness. You can't say, uh, uh, you know, you can't make tools without it. You can't build, you can't build uh, comfort. Uh, you can't build spaceships or even a spear, you see, without that awareness. But the other awareness, 
the centrifugal awareness, which is the, the faith mind, is the mind that is able to leap to greater understanding of the whole. So you're constantly, as, as things get confusing, you're able to make the intuitive leap to a greater whole that includes all the new conditions. You see how that works? Instead of shrinking down to the one, you keep expanding. As, as things change, you keep expanding understanding to include the new variables in a changing world, which is exactly where we are politically today. The world is changing, and we're locked in a, we get, we get locked into a fixed view and hold on to it because we're afraid of the changing world. Here in Blackstone, we get used to, you know, there's just basically two colors, white and black. You get in the car and you go up to New Jersey and you stop at the uh, turnpike. Everything is just, there's no white and black. It's just all shades of brown. <laughs> it's just a sea of, and here there's only one language, English. And you go up, uh, up you go up onto the uh, highways of life, uh, the great highways of America. And everybody's speaking all different kinds of languages, like the Tower of Babel. And that freaks people out. So you come running back to, the, to your home where it's just simple. It's just either or. That's it. <laughs> either black or white. Either English or no English. <laughs> or Spanish, you see. So, with, so this whole world is becoming, you know, relative instead of absolute. And that's freaking people out. So... And it, and it feels like death, chaos. When you, when you lose your orientation and you're lost in the woods or you, you uh, have a moment of, uh, uh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. You know, I lost my fixed point. I lost, the, I, I lost the, the purpose I came into this room was a fixed point. I had a fixed idea. And now it's gone, you see. And so, oh, what am, am I getting dementia? Oh, my God. Mm, you see. So this, this is a very deep subject here. And so you get really down to, uh, on the two halves here, it's logic or intuition. You need them both. You need the intuition to grasp the greater understanding, and then you need the logic to make it work. But what comes first, logic or intuition? What comes first, uh, the absolute or the relative? You see, what, what, or what? Uh, well, maybe not that. But what, what, what comes first is that in a changing world, intuition is very valuable. That's thinking outside of the box. That's grasping a greater understanding and having an idea. See, this is how a business, a new business, works. And this is going on. This is our very creative world we're in right now, because this intuition. This faith mind is very active, even though it seems like it's retarded or, or, or dis discarded, but it's very active, particularly in business. Now, suppose you got a, uh, you know, you got, you know, I don't like the way I was treated or I didn't like it or it got, this got screwed up, it was confusing, something's not working. And you get the idea, oh, if I put this, this, this together, I can come up with a system or a business that will remove the pain I was experiencing. So you come up with a single idea. Now that's a fixed point. And that was created by a faith mind. In other words, conditions were creating pain, and suddenly you come up with an idea, oh, why wow, I could I could put this together and it would solve the pain I was having in those disconnected conditions. So a single idea that is reached through intuition creates a new world in which the pain of the old world was removed. And if it works, I create a business out of it. And the next thing I know, I'm on uh, 60 Minutes or somewhere like that, uh, where they're honoring this uh, uh, some housewife or somebody who just created this 
multi-million dollar business on lipstick or something. I don't know. See what I mean? That, that was created by faith mind. Out of chaos, you create order. Out of chaos, you create a new world, you see. And you can't create a new world if you're fixed on the old world. You see the difference? Either you cling to the old world and fix it so it, and build a wall around it, or you surrender to chaos and create a new world. Let that be our Zen fit for the day. Thank you for dropping in.